Hello everyone and welcome to a video where we are going to discuss uh, in length uh, why Rashid Gabatovich Nezhmedinov never got his title of Grandmaster. Why did it happen? Why was it was he not able to 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 you know win games? Was he just not awarded opportunities to, to face stronger players or what was the cause of this? Uh, because you know I don't know it was maybe some three or four years ago uh, the channel had less than maybe even 50,000 subscribers and I said uh, during uh, numerous streams that if my channel ever uh, reaches uh, 1 million subscribers that I would uh, send a formal petition to FIDE uh, uh, requesting to grant um, uh, Rashid Nejmedinov the title of Grandmaster. Now uh, I never thought that the channel would actually reach 1 million subscribers but now of course I have to revisit that remark and um, uh, it's not possible to award uh, someone a Grandmaster title uh, of course after he has died but it is possible to award uh, someone uh, the title of Honorary Grandmaster. Is it the same thing? Uh, well, in, in terms of uh, any privileges or rights that a Grandmaster might have, yes, it's the same thing. But is it really the same thing? Uh, not really, because uh, 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 up to 2003, FIDE awarded the, the Grandmaster title 30, 31 times, and I'm, you know, I, I don't think you can name even one honorary Grandmaster. Uh, because I mean, it, it, even though it it kind of is the title of Grandmaster, it doesn't. Uh, uh, I mean, it, it's not. Let's face it, it's not. So here uh, in this video, I'm gonna talk a little bit about. Um, uh, about Rashid Nezhmedinov and uh, how he did not get a chance to play all, all, all that many tournaments, uh, why that was so, and we're gonna show a very nice game here that he played against the Grandmaster Vladimir Antoshin, uh, which is basically the game that he feels is, um, uh, well, the, 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 this game is the reason that he did not get his Grandmaster title. But not only the game, uh, there is one specific move that Nezhmedinov himself uh, claims that uh, robbed him of his Grandmaster title, or rather the opportunity to be granted the Grandmaster title. Then we're going to do a little bit of a summary, and then uh, you guys will decide what, what's best, as I still tend to make up my mind. So here, uh, for those of you who are not interested in this uh, article, you're welcome to skip to the game, but uh, I encourage you to, to stay uh, with the article as it features uh, a lot of very interesting uh, uh, stuff and uh, you, know, you will increase your vast knowledge at least tenfold. So that being said, uh, let's check it out. So the, ta the article I will now show you is from the Chess Federation of the Republic of Tatarstan. It's uh, in Tatar, so uh, the, the, the my interface is translated into English, but it's not all that correct. So here I found uh, on chess.com, there is a gentleman named Spektrovsky who translated this to proper English, and now uh, this is what we will use. Uh, so let's check it out. As it states here, this is an excerpt uh, from the book The Chess History of Tataria uh, by Marat Kazanov, published at the Tatarstan Republic Chess Federation site. Uh, and here's the link that you can click on. I will also put a link to this in the description below if you prefer just reading it yourself and then checking out the game. Because I'm, I w I will, I'm not going to read all of it, but I will read the, the most important parts. So it says, as Nezhmedinov's name became more well known, uh, people often ask if he's a grandmaster strength player. And if he was, why didn't he become one? Uh, so uh, I often heard chess fans asking Rashid Gyabatovich himself about that. He would literally explode. There were no tournaments. He would scream. And of course, uh, he had a different version for the press. Uh, it's not that, that there were no tournaments. It's, it's just that uh, there were no tournaments for him. And we're gonna we're gonna get get to that. So let's check that. Nezhmedinov could really become a grandmaster in 1954 to 1958 when he was uh, on his performance peak. How many grandmaster tournaments were held in the USSR back then? Uh, and that's exactly one. It was the Alekhin Memorial of 1956, where five grandmasters represented the Soviet Union: Botvinnik, Smyslov, uh, Keres, Bronstein, and Mark Taimanov. Masters were not invited to such tournaments, so Nezhmedinov never had a chance of of winning any norms. And uh, now let's look at which Soviet players did become grandmasters in that period uh, where Rashid Gabatovich was considered to be the strongest. In 1954, uh, nobody got a grandmaster title from the Soviet Union. In 1955, only one player, for a future world champion Boris Pasky, and he won it... Uh, 
not not by pure chance of course he played very well but it was uh it, it was it was definitely a stroke of luck he won the youth world championship and qualified for the interzonal tournament where he got his grandmaster's norm but boris was very lucky the world championship in antwerp uh, ended on the 8th of august and the interzonal which luckily was held in gothenburg uh, began in one week on the 15th of august and spassky got there in time which considering the soviet bureaucracy of the time was quite a feat in itself uh, in 1956, again, only one player uh, was awarded uh, the, the Grandmaster title, that is Viktor Korchnoi. Uh, and in 1957, again, only one player, Mikhail Tal, uh, who won the Soviet championship. So in 1958 and 1959, no Soviet players became Grandmaster. So in those six years, from 1954 to 1959, only three Soviet players became Grandmasters, Spassky, Tal, uh, and uh, Viktor Korchnoi. And those are not just players, those are absolute monsters, those are, those are legends. So, uh, I mean, that uh, puts, uh, puts, uh, puts uh, his chance a little bit uh, into perspective. And how was Nizhmedinov supposed to become a Grandmaster if he never played a tournament with the Grandmaster norms? Now, uh, the, the author also says that younger players might ask, okay, but if there were no tournaments in the USSR, why didn't he just go abroad and play and win some norms? Uh, the problem is uh that the the soviet people lived behind the iron curtain as he states uh this term was popularized by winston churchill who said in march 1946 in fulton uh the iron curtain came down across the whole continent so soviet citizens were forbidden to go abroad without express permission from the authorities and even on 8th 8th of june 1935 a law was passed that punished escaping through the state border with execution with the criminals relatives getting punished too so not only were you getting punished but also uh, your family could get in trouble as well uh, in 1962 of course nobody was executed anymore but the leningrad city court sentenced the defector rudolf nurev at seven years of imprisonment and confiscation of property for treason so although you, you don't get executed i mean you, you kind of lose everything uh, any contacts with foreigners had to be approved by the authorities or else you could have ended up in jail very few players could play abroad at this time so, uh, as you can see, Nezhmedinov could not play within the USSR, but you, you couldn't uh, really go anywhere you wanted in those days. So, uh, Korchnoi also remembers uh, Nezhmedinov. He said, I played my first tournament after my marriage in Sochi. This was the Russian championship and it was won by Nezhmedinov, one of the strongest Soviet masters. For some reason, he was very rarely allowed to go abroad and obviously he never became a grandmaster because of that. Nezhmedinov was awarded the international master title after finishing second in Bukharest in 1954 that was probably the strongest foreign tournament uh, he played in and uh uh, was Nishmedinov a Grandmaster strength player? Uh, here are some of his results. So here you can see the results of the 18th Russian Championship in Sochi, 18, uh, 1958, uh, where Nishmedinov won first place. There is also the Soviet Championship semi-final in Rostov-Odon in 1958. Also Nishmedinov wins first place. And here we have the USSR Team Championship in Vilnius uh, in 1958, where he played board one. Uh, he scored four and a half uh, out of eight. So... Uh, you might think four and a half out of eight isn't all that impressive, but uh, the the lineup in this tournament is just insane. So there's Kolmov, Korchnoi, Geller, uh, Keres, Bronstein, Boleslavsky, and sa says uh, with the exception of Shishnov and Zilber, who finished last, everyone else here was a super grandmaster. And uh, scoring four and a half out of eight here, so that's uh, over 50% uh, in such a field, is uh, definitely worthy worthy of of a grandmaster norm. And uh, Rashid Gabatovic was on equal footing with all these, uh, all this chess elite. His results obviously show that uh, at his career peak in 1956 to 1958, Nezhmedinov reached grandmaster level. This is also proven mathematically. There is this website called Chess Metrics where you can check how strong would, uh, for example, Capablanca be if he uh, had, uh, you know, if he lived today and had uh, such results against uh, against his contemporaries nowadays. And it says here that. Um, uh, here uh, he would be rated 2706 so that's an incredible rating and uh, he would be ranked 21st in the world uh, and uh, not just in the Soviet Union. Uh, Alex Alexei Suetin said that uh, I'm sure that now Nizhmedino would surely get his Grandmaster Norm but he was born too early. 
And here we also say, uh, can see that uh, Belokoptyov uh, uh, in his book about Nizhmedinov also asked the question, why such a brilliant player failed to reach the Olympus of chess art, failed to become a grandmaster? I asked Nizhmedinov himself about that very delicately, and Rashid Gebatovich smoothed out uh, his champion's band, uh, thought, for, uh, thought for a long time, then said, many chess fans ask me this question. They can't understand why I didn't get the grandmaster title. Frankly, there's nothing surprising about that. Prominent players such as Botvinnik, Smyslov, Tal, uh, Spassky, Fischer performed brilliantly already at the age of 15, both in their countries and abroad. And I was only beginning to study chess at that age. All modern grandmasters had a solid theoretical base around age 20 becoming masters. There was a 20-year gap between them and me. And this obviously was the main obstacle that didn't allow me to become a grandmaster. It's only logical. The master's answer was very simple and clear. So here we have... Uh, bit of a, a Rashid's uh, insight into why the Grandmaster title eluded him. Although this was all uh, maybe also a prepared response because you couldn't, you know, just say anything you, you, you wanted back then. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, you, you could read the entire article, but uh, I'm, I'm just going to go through some more important parts. Uh, still, Nezhmedinov did get a chance to become a Grandmaster, and this is where our game that we are now covering uh, com comes into play. Uh, during, <coughs> sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> uh, during the Khrushchev thaw, uh, Soviet players started getting more opportunities to play in international tournaments. And so, when Nezhmedino was almost 52 years old, he was finally invited to a tournament in Sochi with a Grandmaster norm. In those times, you only had to get a single norm to become a Grandmaster. The age, to, uh, the, the age already took its toll, and Rashid Gebatovich was past his peak, but he still fought on. And he he uh, played a very impressive tournament and won a lot of great games. Uh, even won against uh, Boris Spassky. It says, uh, after four rounds, Nezhmedinov had two points and played white against Boris Spassky. Already a world championship candidate at that point, Spassky sacrificed an exchange and got some compensation. But after the adjournment, Nezhmedinov gave the exchange back and created an unstoppable mating attack. Some games were good, some really bad. Uh, and in one of the last rounds, Nezhmedinov played against uh, Antoshin. Uh, this was the decisive game. I'm putting it here without much commentary. But we are, of course, uh, going to cover it uh, and uh, all right we're, we're gonna skip uh, uh, rest of the article so I'm just gonna finish with this and then we're gonna check out the game but like I said it will be in the description below you're welcome to go uh, through all of it yourself uh, so uh, here uh, let's just continue this uh, I wanted to just mention one more part uh, yeah, uh, Rashid Gabatovich was a very impulsive man, and the losses upset him quite heavily. Probably due to that, in the next round, Nezhmedinov agreed to a draw in a better position after just 23 moves, and he couldn't make Grandmaster Norm by one, one and a half point. So this is uh, referring to this game that we are showing, but we're going to get back to that. Uh, and also, he scored 8.5 out of the needed 10. The fact that 6 years past his peak, aged 52, Nezhmedinov still managed to score... 85% of a Grandmaster's norm only proves that during his most stellar performances, uh, Rashid Gabatovich was a Grandmaster strength player, but simply never had a chance to achieve that elusive norm. Uh, and after he turned 46, it was uh, already hard for him to withstand the intensity of the tournaments. Your memory... Uh, your your memory can't register the novelties all that well, your calculation skills get numbed, it's pure uh, physiology. Nezhmedino was sure that if he won the game against Antoshin, uh, he would have gotten his norm. Uh, he, uh, he would emotionally share his sorrow with many people, managing to convince most of them. Obviously, if he won that game, he wouldn't have made the quick draw the next day, so Rashid Gebatovich was pretty sure that a single chessboard square decided everything for him. And that's what we're going to cover in this game. Uh, but, you know, it, it's very tricky. He was very upset. He thought that if he moved his bishop just one square further, he would uh, he would have become a grandmaster. A ridiculous accident, though, to say the truth, uh, the, the, there's nothing accidental. In my humble opinion, Nezhmedinov uh, didn't like bishop to a8 because uh, after that he would have had to convert his material advantage in a long and boring endgame, uh, but he wanted to checkmate his opponent. But, okay, now we're just going to switch to the game because uh, I, I, I'm imagining you would prefer to see the game first uh, than to just hear about it. So that being said, uh, let's check out the game. So uh, here, uh, here we have it. Uh, Rashid Nezhmedinov versus Vladimir Antonchin. Uh, uh, Nezhmedinov with the white pieces and he opens with e4. So let's see this uh, game that, uh, you know... Uh, 
uh, st stole the, the Grandmaster title uh, from Nizhmedinov. So e4, uh, we have e6 uh, going for the French defense. We have d3 and d5 now, striking in the center. Uh, here uh, we have knight to d2, defending the e4 pawn, and now comes knight to f6. Both players just developing. We have g3 by Rashid, preparing to fianchetto to the light square bishop, and b6 now. Black does the same. Uh, we have bishop to g2, and now bishop to b7. And now, as this pawn uh, can be advanced further on, e5 now, forcing this knight to move. We have knight f to d7, and now uh, continuing development with knight g to f3. And black now, of course, grabs more space in the center with c5. And this is all still uh, played today. Uh, we have castles by Rashid, and now knight to c6. Uh, with a double attack on the e pawn, so rook to e1, defending the pawn, and now queen to c7, adding a third attacker to the pawn here, and queen to e2. Rashid adds a third defender here. We have h6, uh, and now h4. Uh, we have g5, uh, now saying that, okay, I'm gonna castle queen side, I'm gonna open up your king side, and I'm going to attack you on the king side. So Rashid captures on g5, we have h captures and knight, knight captures. So Anto um, uh, Antoshin uh, sacrifices a pawn uh, and he wants to, he wants to attack Rashid. Uh, and here the question is whether you now recapture on e5 or not. The problem is if queen captures, uh, then let's say everything gets traded off. Uh, queen captures, knight captures, and now uh, a lot of moves can be played. For example, f4 can be played. Uh, you could play uh, something else, you could play uh, just uh, d develop the knight here, but there's also the tricky knight to c4, and probably why uh, Antoshin decided to go uh, against this line, because now uh, there's a, there's a lot to a lot to value it here. For example, if you capture the knight, bishop captures here, attacks the rook, and if rook moves the bishop to a6 now, and it's not, not an easy position to, to evaluate, and you kind of want to keep things... Um, uh, simple, you don't want to over overcomplicate against Nezhmedinov. So instead, after this knight captures on g5, we have knight to d4 first, attacking the queen. Now the queen has to move as the c2 pawn will fall, so queen d1 is the only move. And only now knight captures on e5. So Antoshin keeps the queens on the board. We have c3, pushing the knight away, and now knight to f5. Uh, and here, well, you could continue this game in a lot of ways. Uh, you can see that black really is mounting a nice attack. This bishop might come to d6, then both of the bishops will be uh, eyeing that king side. Uh, the the h file for the rook is open, and Rashid uh, er, doesn't want to be on the defensive. Uh, he jumps into the attack, and he does so by rook captures on e5. So now uh, he sacrifices the exchange. There's only one move for black. Black has to capture. Uh, the rook, so queen captures on e5, and now queen to a4 with check. So now black definitely loses castling privileges. Queen, uh, king to e7, and now knight d to f3, pushing the queen back and preparing to develop the dark square bishop with bishop to f4. Uh, we have queen to c7, and now uh, not going for uh, that right away. First, he switches the queen over to g4, so just queen to g4. Uh, if you if you go for bishop to f4 right away, yeah, you could play it, but then queen to c6 offers a queen trade, and uh, there is really no a good aggressive square for for white. And uh, Rashid prefers to keep the queens on the board. So instead, after this queen to c7 move, we have queen to g4, and now okay, now it's definitely white who's on the attack. Uh, so here uh, we have knight g to e7, and this is a this is a very uh, very good move because if black plays something slow, let's say black play something like a6 uh, danger lurks in the position you cannot allow bishop to f4 uh, with an attack on the queen because after the queen moves you get rook to e1 uh, with all of these uh, crazy threats here now queen captures an f5 a threat because the uh, e pawn is pinned and now if the knight moves now you can just capture an f7 and that's it uh, you've completely shattered black's defenses of course if black captures 95 check wins the queen so uh, the position is very, very poisonous. So after this queen to g4 move, we have knight to g7, not uh, allowing any any of this to come with tempo. And now, uh, not immediately with bishop to f4. Bishop to f4 now would run into f5. That's the idea behind knight to g7. Antoshin uh, playing very well here. And uh, Nezhmedinov couldn't really uh, claim any advantage here. Now the queens have to come, out, uh, come off the board. So instead, after knight to g7, we have knight to h4 by Rashid. And now uh, you can't really push the f pawn because knight to g6 check will be deadly. So we have king to e8, not allowing any 
uh, such moves to come with check and now again Rashid uh, again not ready to go bishop to f4 first strikes with c4 puts pressure on d5 and also wants to open up this diagonal and here uh, the thing is if you go d captures on c4 first bishop to f4 and it's a very very difficult position for black to play after uh, after the queen moves uh, queen to d7 for example then the knight comes to e4 you're already threatening knight f6 check to win the queen and uh, uh, it, it is a playable position but it is very complicated so instead after this c4 move we have rook to d8 brings the rook into the game and now c captures on d5 we have bishop captures on d5 and now knight to e4 keeping the bishops on the board and now again uh, preparing to uh, you know uh, cause some trouble here with knight to f6 check so here uh, we have bishop captures on e4 there was a, a slight improvement here knight to h5 is an incredibly strong move for black because uh uh, now the knight prevents a knight to f6 check the knight cannot be captured there it's on an excellent square it's also preparing bishop to g7 to uh, continue development for black then the bishop can come into the game the rook can come into the game so knight to h5 although uh, very uh, you know weird looking it's actually pretty great so here after knight to e4 we have bishop captures on e4 instead uh, bishop captures and now knight to h5 so a bit of a different move order but now the knight finds its way to h5 and now the thing is uh, here uh, Rashid goes queen to f3 uh, the problem is if you continue with bishop to g5 which seems like a normal developing move the problem is black is very happy to trade here bishop e7 and after captures and captures for example queen g5 check there's king d7 and the black king escapes and uh, if you try to do something like d4 to try and open up the c file for example for the rook uh, it's not a problem because black has this tricky knight captures on g3 and that's the problem f captures on g3 rook d to g8 and now it's black who's on the attack and uh, white is white is done for here you, you're gonna have to give up a piece to, to simply close off the the g file but still just d captures on c5 uh, and after queen captures with check the queens get traded off for example and the black is just winning so uh, although you want to develop that dark square bishop it, it just never seems to be the 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 appropriate time to do so and now the knight on h5 also prevents the bishop to f4 so the knight on h5 uh, is is just a brilliant piece so here Rashid goes queen to f3 he puts pressure on not on the queen obviously uh, but on c6 uh, bishop to c6 check is coming so here we have queen to e5 again an incredible strong move by Antoshin uh, not only uh, will the king now be super safe uh, here uh, but also Bishop to g5 check moves uh, are not possible the Queen is guarding that and also you will have additional support in the future for for f6 so here we have Bishop to d2 uh, there's always time to play Bishop to c6 check not really doing anything here and here uh, Rashid offers a pawn uh, otherwise Bishop to c3 is coming and then white wins material and here again a very very complicated position i will uh mention what what's uh, the the absolute best move here uh, but uh uh Voloshin went for queen captures on b2 queen to f6 is actually the way to go but again it's super complicated and uh, of course you can't afford all the time in the world to calculate but the thing is you offer a queen trade and after rashid declines now you play bishop to g7 and now after bishop to c3 with an attack on the queen uh queen has to move and now uh, things uh, can get traded off but now the thing is knight to g6 so this is what Rashid uh, uh, would uh, probably have played if it if it came to this but the problem uh, for white is that this is okay for black and now uh, you can just capture here of course you don't want to capture the knight then you allow queen capture on e6 and so on but first you eliminate the bishop now comes bishop to c6 with check as it the nice uh, the knight nicely covers e7 and f8 squares rook to d7 blocking and now you white really doesn't have anything better but to trade everything off knight captures on h8 bishop captures on h8 and now you can capture on d7 captures with check captures and now queen a4 check you uh, start going after the queen side pawns king to d6 and now queen captures on a7 and now we get this position where you have a rook against a knight and the bishop but uh, uh you know uh, all in all black black should be better uh, for example bishop to d4 preparing to put some pressure on f2 king to g2 and pinning now knight captures on g3 is a threat so king g2 we're gonna play queen to d2 now again put pressure on the f2 pawn queen captures on f7 defending and now finally knight to f6 and now the queen can capture on f2 so you have to play rook to f1 it's kind of passive for white and the black should be very happy with this position uh, if anything it's black who's pushing for a win here 
So uh, Voloshin could have gone for this queen to f6 idea, but he, I guess he didn't want to allow this bishop to find this beautiful outpost. He played queen captures on b2, and now he also attacks the bishop here. So here we have bishop to c6 check, uh, king has to move, king to e7, and now bishop to g5 with check. And finally f6, uh, the f6 is now nicely defended by the knight and by the queen. Uh, interestingly, if you go knight to f6, that makes little sense. It immediately loses the game. Knight to f5 check just uh, destroys black. After he captures you, you bring the rook into the game with check, king to d6, and now just bishop to f4 with check. Uh, there are no moves for the black king. You have to play queen to e5, and that's it. Queen e5, bishop captures with check, and you're very quickly getting checkmated. So instead, after bishop to g5, we have f6, Voloshin defends, uh, and Rashid goes knight to g6 with check. If king to f7, you lose on the spot, uh, because uh, the knight captures on h8 comes with check, so you have to go the other way. King to d6, and now comes rook to e1. Uh, white rook is hanging on a1, so you have to move it, rook to e1, and now comes f captures on g5 and this is indeed the strongest move uh, for black it's not just some you know random material grabbing move uh, it is in fact the, the the strongest move so f captures on g5 and now we get uh, to the position that's been haunting rashid his entire life uh, this is the position that he claims that robbed him of his grandmaster title so feel free to pause the video here and uh, you know, try to find the the absolute best move in the position while while I give you a couple of seconds. So uh, for those of you who were able to do it, congratulations uh, on not playing uh, bishop to b7. Uh, and for those of you who just want to enjoy the show, uh, it's actually bishop to a8. And this is the move uh, Rashid uh, was so angry with, his, with himself that he didn't find. The problem with the move uh, bishop to b7 is, yes, you are threatening queen to c6 checkmate. But there's a very easy defense to this. Uh, the, 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 <laughs> there's just king to c7. And this is what Rashid missed. Uh, and after king to c7, the problem is that the king can now escape to b8. The problem with the move bishop to, e, bishop to a8 that Rashid did not play uh that it's extremely complicated now black really has to figure out how to go about this as uh, you are still threatening checkmate this still will be checkmate the knight is covering these two squares the e5 and d7 squares and with uh, uh, Antoshin being very low on time, Rashid thought that he will have excellent chances here. The problem is anything other than giving up the exchange loses the game. And uh, just to give you an example, for example, uh, if you play rook to c8, you guard against queen to c6 checkmate, it's not a problem. Bishop to b7. Now again, attacks the rook, the, the rook has to move and you still have to guard against checkmate. So here, uh, rook to c7, obviously only move. And now comes the move that's... Uh, Probably the one that Rashid missed when, when deciding uh, wh whether to even go for this or I don't know. Uh, and that move is d4. This is the only winning move in the position. The point is that you have to uh, block queen's defense of the rook here on h8. And now everything is simply working in white's favor and it's very easy to miss this. Uh, the point is uh, if you capture with the queen, queen captures on d4, just rook d1 and you win the queen. Uh, if you don't do that, if you do something else, for example, you just continue developing bishop to g7, you say, okay, I, I might give back some material, still insufficient, because now rook captures an e6 check, uh, destroys black, king captures, and now queen to d5 with check, king to f6, and now queen to d6 with check, king to f7, and now bishop to d5 with check. So this is pretty crazy stuff, king to e8, and now again bishop to c6 with check. So now the king has to go to f7, now we grab on h8 with check, bishop captures, and finally the rook is captured with check. So queen captures on c7 with check, king to f8, and now we get this position uh, where uh, black is still up a piece, but it doesn't matter because white is... Uh, uh, white is able to, to win back uh, at least one, if not both of them. So here, queen to d8 check, king to g7, doesn't matter what, what, what black plays, uh, queen captures on g5 with check, king to f8, and now you even go queen to h6 with check. You want to pick up uh, uh, the, the piece while delivering check. So king e7, now comes queen captures on h8, and this is the best way to go because it now uh, defends the knight. Okay, you didn't win the piece with check, uh, but you are threatening to win 
uh, to win material here. And now the problem is uh, there's no good way to defend the knight. Uh, if you go knight f6, just queen to g7 check, then d5, and you will win the remaining material. And if queen to b1 with check, king to g2, uh, there's, again, no, no good move for black. The absolute best for black is knight to f4 check here. Now, if uh, pawn captures, then you have this queen to g6 check, winning the bishop on c6, but uh, white can just ignore you, queen, uh, king to h2. And now the thing is, uh, again, uh, w w what do you play here? The pawn is just marching up the board. Now you don't have to worry about uh, any checks. Uh, also, pawn captures knight is a possibility. And here we would have the absolute best queen to f5 now, threatening uh, queen to h3 check. And after you give up the, this piece, uh, now queen captures an f4. And now you might be hoping for, a, for some sort of a perpetual, but it will not be possible. King g1, you're going to go queen to g4 check. Now the bishop blocks. Bishop can just block this. And after c captures on d4, yes, you do have a pass pawn, but now just queen to e5 with check. King to f7 and now queen to e4. Offering a queen trade, we have queen to d1 check and bishop to f1. And now with the with the complete control of the d3 square, it's only a matter of time uh, before you actually uh, before you actually uh, manage this. Uh, so this is what would happen if this if this is played uh, after bishop to, to a8. Uh, yeah, I mentioned that uh, you, you could also capture the bishop, for example, rook captures on a8, and this is the only way to play this, uh, rook captures, uh, because what would follow uh, is queen captures on a8, just grabbing that rook, and now knight captures on g3, and this is uh, the, absolute, the absolute top defense for black that uh, offers him uh, br brilliant counterplay, and here we have to figure out how to go about the position. Uh, obviously, you cannot capture the knight, the knight is off limits, maybe you can capture the rook. So what happens if you just pick up the rook? The problem is now you play knight to e to check first and after the king moves now you uh, capture the knight here because now uh, rook captures is impossible. Um, uh, if you go for rook captures on e2 then just bishop to g7 and you have a nice, uh, a nice queen trade offering and also the queen cannot leave the defense of the h1 square because queen to h1 would be checkmate so this would be this would be perfectly fine for black uh, on the other hand after this uh, uh, after this knight to g3 move uh, maybe okay since you can't capture that what actually happens if you capture the knight well then you have this queen to h2 check and that's it King to f1, and now you force a queen trade. Queen to h1 check, uh, you have to trade queens. Queen captures, rook captures with check, and now king to e2. You trade everything off, captures, captures, and the resulting endgame is completely winning for uh, for black as uh, you're up two pawns, it's not it's not even close. So instead, uh, after this knight captures on g3, we can't go after the, the rook here on h8, we cannot go after the knight. So what can we play? Uh, well, queen to b8 check, and this is the only move that uh, allows white to keep the advantage, uh, but uh, it's uh, very, very complicated. So the idea is queen to b8 check, and only now after the king moves, now you play knight captures on h8. But now it's a little bit different, uh, because now after knight to e2 with check, king to f1 and queen captures here, uh, we have this queen to e8 with check. And now we are ready to capture the knight with the king and also guard the h5 square uh, from uh, being checked by the black queen. So here after king to d6, let's say, now we're going to capture the knight uh, and we would probably see something like bishop to g7 offering a queen trade and this is the position that uh, uh, would have occurred uh, had uh, both players played uh, with the absolute, uh, you know, uh, ac accuracy. Uh, the problem is, um, even though this position, uh, okay, white white is the one definitely playing for a win, but uh, it's very hard to say if uh, Rashid could win this position, but that's besides the point. Uh, Rashid, what Rashid uh, meant uh, was that uh, in, in this position, had he found a bishop to a8, that with both players being low on time, this is move 30, they have to reach move 40 to reach time control, uh, he would have uh, he would have excellent winning chances. And the position was so complicated that Antoshin, who was lower on time, uh, uh, might might have uh, might have succumbed to you know all the all the all the intricacies of the position, uh, but uh, getting back to the actual game, uh, Rashid played bishop to b7 here, and this is much different because yes you are threatening checkmate, but uh, Antoshin played king to c7, and now there is no point in going queen to c6 check because the king just goes to b8, and now what do you have here? If you capture the rook, there's no better move. 
Queen captures, you don't really have an attack anymore. Rook captures on e6, that doesn't matter. Just queen to a1 with check, and you will cover the a6 square. For example, king g2, queen captures on a2. Now you're pre preventing bishop to, to a6 to threaten checkmate. And if white goes bishop here to threaten checkmate this way, it's not a problem. Queen to a6 is in time to save the day. So this is a problem after the king to c7 move. And uh, here Rashid uh, definitely... Uh, I, I mean, probably realized what he has done. So here, uh, he captured the rook right away. Knight captures on h8. We have queen captures. And now, again, uh, not going after rook to rook captures on e6. Because rook captures on e6, again, uh, you run into this uh, ugly knight captures on g3 move. Uh, the queen cannot capture because the bishop is hanging. So you'd have to capture with the pawn. Uh, but if you capture with the pawn, it, it's just very bad. You get queen to d4 with check. And then it's just uh, incredibly difficult difficult to play this. Uh, king to g2, queen captures on g3, and it's basically white who's uh, who's fighting for a draw here. So what you would have to do after knight captures on g3, you'd have to go queen to f7, uh, get the queen into the attack with check, king to b8, and now rook to e8, hoping for, uh, for some rook captures here, but it doesn't matter because black can just trade everything, captures, captures, and captures, and there's not much uh, to be done here. Uh, uh, Nishmedino would only have a draw here, queen to d7 check, and now you would be able to continue checking the black king, doesn't really matter where you go, you, you will always uh, have a check, uh, not there obviously, uh, king, uh, king, queen to d8 check, and then you continue checking. Uh, so that would happen if you go for something like rook captures on e6. So bishop to a8 now, but now bishop to a8 is much different. It's not as that bishop to a8 uh, two moves ago. Uh, so here we have rook to d6. This is the only move uh, that uh, gives black the advantage and Voloshin finds it. So here, uh, if you continue with queen to b7 check, king to d8, it's not a problem. Queen to b8 with check, uh, again connecting uh, with the rook, the rook is okay, defended by the bishop. King to e7, and now queen captures an a7 check, but king f6 and the black king, uh, you know, uh, avoids uh, any, any further checks. So instead, after rook to d6, we have d4, hoping to open up that c file for the rook, but uh, this is simply ignored. Knight, knight back to f6. Uh, we have uh, queen to b7 with check now, uh, but now comes king to d8. Uh, we have d5, uh, last one last uh, you know uh, uh, resort before before calling it a day, uh, but just knight captures on d5. Uh, we have queen to b8 with check now, king to e7. We have bishop captures on d5, rook captures and queen captures on a7 with check. Rook to d7 blocking. Even though this is not the best move, uh, Voloshin. Uh, sorry, Antoshin uh, knows that uh, uh, this is uh, this is the way to go. Uh, we have queen captures on b6 and now queen to f6. Finally mobilizing his pieces. Uh, Rashid even grabs one more pawn with check. Queen captures on c5, king to f7 and now queen to e3. And even though this is only move 42 uh, and uh, Rashid still has a pass pawn, he's down a piece and it was in this position that Rashid Nezhmedinov resigned the game. Uh, as there really is nothing more to be done here. You could prolong it, you could, you know, drag it on, but he knows that uh, black is winning here, and that's why he resigned. So, uh, really, really intense game, and uh, who knows what might have happened, but uh, this is important for you to know. This is the position that Nezhmedinov uh, was analyzing over and over after the game was finished for, for years to come, and he analyzed it with, with a lot of other players, and uh, this is basically the, uh, the, the moment uh, that he thinks that uh, ruined, ruined the possibility of uh, him achieving the Grandmaster title. So, bishop to a8 uh, instead of bishop to b7. And okay, even though uh, the computer with the absolute best moves uh, does not lose to bishop to a8, when you're low on time playing against Nizhmedinov, who's a very tricky player, uh, he, I, I believe he would have excellent chances in uh, getting his Grandmaster title in this tournament. And also, as it said, uh, in the next game, uh, he uh, agreed to a draw in a better position uh, on move 23, which is something Rashid would never do. Uh, but I, he was down uh, be because he lost this game and he drew that one. So as he finished the tournament with eight and a half and he needed 10 points out of 15 to qualify for a Grandmaster Norm, uh, he was, uh, uh, well, uh, I, I will not say bereft of one, but, uh, you know, it, it, it definitely slipped right through his hands. So now I would just like to return to this article, just to, you know, go through uh, the, the final part as it didn't really make sense for me to show it to you guys uh, without knowing the game. 
Uh, but yeah, it says that uh, here that he was a very impulsive man and losses upset him quite heavily. Uh, probably due to that, in the next round, Nezhmedinov agreed to a draw in a better position after just 23 moves, which you already said, and he couldn't make the Grandmaster norm by one and a half point. Uh, so he scored eight and a half points out of the need at 10. Uh, the Grandmaster's norm only proves that during his most stellar performances, Rashid Gabatovic was a Grandmaster strength player, but simply never had a chance to achieve that elusive norm. As here, uh, even at the age of 52, he scored uh, the 85% uh, basically needed of, of a Grandmaster norm. Uh, because uh, as he says, your memory cannot register the novelties all that well, your calculation skills get numbed. Uh, it's pure physiology. Nezhmedino was sure that if he won the game against Antoshin, the one that we've just shown, he would have gotten his norm, uh, he would emotionally share his sorrow with many people, managing to convince most of them. Obviously, if he won that game, uh, he wouldn't have made that quick draw the next day, so Rashid Gabatovic was pretty sure that a single chessboard square decided everything for him. So, bishop to a8 instead of bishop to b7. He was very upset, he thought that if he moved his bishop just one square further, he would have become a grandmaster. Uh, a ridiculous accident, though, uh, to say the truth, uh, there's nothing accidental. Uh, in my humble opinion, Nezhmedinov didn't like uh, uh, bishop to a8 because after that he would have had to convert his material advantage in a long and boring endgame, the one that we've shown, uh, but he wanted to checkmate his opponent. His desire to attack compromised his technique. Uh, why do you think that? Uh, I know his chess tastes. Uh, here's an example. Uh, he once showed us uh, a beautiful combination, but there was a hole in it. Everyone analyzed the various moves and were glad that they managed to find a refutation. Nezhmedinov came to us, pushed the pieces off the board and said, you've defiled such a beauty. That's uh, the, the kind of a guy Nezhmedinov was. Uh, and he was so upset that he stopped the lesson after that and told us to go home. Uh, and there's another example. He started uh, one of the lessons by saying, "I can't understand why they why they're giving the titles. Uh, why why uh, aren't they giving titles for beautiful playing? I'm going to show you a game played by a first category player. I would have awarded him with the master's title on the spot. Chess beauty was more precious to him than chess truth. Uh, that's why he remained a grandmaster of the beauty and didn't become a grandmaster. But sport is sport, and chess is a sport." Uh, so that, that that being said, now you know a little bit more and um, uh, what why uh, Rashid never truly became a grandmaster, and uh, uh, yeah, I mean uh, he he did get get his opportunity to finally win a norm, but it was much too late, and he was already very uh, very old, not very old, but not in you know uh, in his absolute best years where he. Uh, would probably uh, get more than more than enough points. Uh, so in, if with uh, at the age of 52 he got uh, eight and a half out of the needed ten, uh, you know, in his prime years uh, getting the the full ten, I don't think w would be much of a problem. Uh, but here lies the problem for us. It doesn't really matter if we petition for Nezhmedinov to be granted the Grandmaster title. It will not be Grandmaster title. It will only be a title of honorary Grandmaster. And um, like I said, do do you know any? The honorary grandmasters, uh, chances are you don't. And I think uh, uh, granting Nezhmedinov uh, yeah, the title of honorary grandmaster would, would only tarnish uh, the good name of, of Rashid Nezhmedinov. As uh, we, we often said, you know, there are there are many, many grandmasters who never became legends, but uh, Rashid may, may just remain a legend who never became a grandmaster. So I don't know. What's your opinion on this? If you're really up for it, I mean, I, I, we could we could definitely consider it because I mean it's not a problem. Anyone can make a petition, but uh, I, I'm I, I still think I need convincing because I think uh, that I I, I kind of prefer Rashid the way he is, and that that way you know he can uh, live on uh, by by us showing it showing his great games uh, to our friends in the bar and the library, and. Um, I don't know. I, I just I just think it, it would spoil uh, spoil it and uh, you know everything he's done because without him receiving the title uh, during his lifetime I I don't know uh, maybe maybe I'm wrong I don't know I'm I'm very interested in what you think about this so do share your uh, opinions in the comment section below as uh, you know th this is quite a long video I think this is the longest video I've ever made so congratulations to everyone who you know made it all the way all all the way to the end uh, so yeah. 
Uh, that's the game and the story of the Nezhmedinov's uh, Grandmaster title. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, very look, Looking forward to reading your comments very much. Uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Alexander Kleibrink, uh, Robert Leinbach, Nikolai Akimov, Mr. Hoodie Guy, and Kevin Lewis for a contribution to my channel. Thank you a lot. I really appreciate it. Uh, as usual, you can check two of my previous videos here. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you soon. Uh, continuing the coverage of the Morphe Saga, checking up on your wonderful suggestions, and whatever else happens in the chess world. So thank you all. I will see you soon, and have an excellent rest of your day.